Now, we are moving on to segment three, where we're going to talk about how to host tabletop RPG games for children, engaging storytelling and creativity. And this time, I think I do start with Naga Hyde. So I'm going to ask him, what techniques do you use to craft stories that captivate and inspire children's imaginations? Uh, so I will use what I know about the TV shows they're interested in or books or, uh, whatever other interests they have. Like for, for instance, uh, after I started my kids on riffs, I moved them over to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for a little while and my son loved the cartoon. So I actually had him and a couple of other kids play as the Ninja Turtles cool. fighting foot clan, you know, going as bonkers as the cartoon was, you know, all the crazy gadgetry stuff, all the, the, the little comedy things that would Cowabonga, dude. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that, that's what I like to, to do to help, you know, get their imagination and inspire them to like get more into the game. Okay. Uh, I wasn't ready for you. To, uh, <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. Uh, I mean, we do, the answers don't have to be an hour long. That's, that's for sure. It's just, you know, as long as we give out some good information. Uh, what do I want to ask you? Mm -hmm. I don't like questions like that. Do you deal with pacing when it comes to children? The pacing no. of a game? Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't care. So, I don't care about pacing. Yeah, it's no. that's something that even when it comes to playing with adults, I don't care about pacing either. And people are the pacing of the game's off. What do you mean? You roll dice and you talk about what you care. Anyway, how about this? How do you adapt your style based on the reactions and feedback from the children at that time at the table? So let's just say something that you thought was going well. All of a sudden, uh, two two of the players don't two of the children don't seem that they're either interested or they're just now they're like, uh, how, how would you adapt? Uh, so I would adjust based on what I know about those children, in terms of like maybe. Maybe I focus too much on the interest of some of the other kids at the table. I would then, the ones that don't seem as interested in, try and figure out a way to bring in something that I know they're interested in into the game. Like maybe add an uh, NPC character uh, from a TV show that, that either of them or both of them knows or or a situation that they that I know they're familiar with from uh, episode of Kim Possible or whatever cartoon they're into at the time. Now, now let's flip the script. You had just this little NPC or this little side anecdote thing, but man, did they grab? They latched onto that. They're laughing. They're having a great time. They keep they keep wanting to you know we'd consider meme it up, but for them just being kids, you know, just just hold on to that uh, that scene or that scenario. Uh, how would you adapt at that point? Like you never intended would, for it to be this important or this big. It's like oh, that was just a side clown, you know. I would just build off. I if. If everybody was enjoying it, I'd just keep building off of it. That's why when I run a game, I play off the cuff. I I, I can adapt based on how the, the players are interacting with the NPCs and just continue developing the story. But the one thing I do do while I'm, while I'm doing that is I will then write down that character name so i can add them later again when the scene changes to something else so that that interaction can continue later in the story it's not just a one time i threw this in here to get interest back into the game no i'm gonna bring that character back and have more inter more depth with their characters so that their characters can develop their own story within the overall campaign that's being played okay 
All right, uh, Lauren Mattias, what techniques do you use to craft stories that captivate and inspire children's imaginations? Um, uh, I, I actually don't think I have a very good answer for this because I'm running a sandbox. Um, uh, so I don't, okay. I don't, well, then, then let, let me ask you your follow-up right away. Cause I saved this one for you. <laughs> okay. How do you involve the children in the world building process of the game? Well, um, again, uh, shadow darks always on, um, uh, initiative system kind of forces it. And, uh, I, when, they uh one of them has an idea uh you know i say well hey if that's something you want to do you can do it and i'm not one to be even with adults uh clamp down on metagaming too much because i again it's a team sport if people need to talk things out i by all means talk it out try to figure it out whatever and so you know they will have a conversation about what they want to do um they had an interesting um solution to getting across the river to get to uh the bandit camp um uh because uh they didn't have boats so they started going into the swamps and found a ford a fjord and whatnot and i sort of or not a fjord excuse me a ford and um uh kind of explained what that is and then they worked out a problem uh or assumed a solution to the problem because it was kind of a fast flowing river right um when they went to the caves of chaos on the very first day and almost got killed by the very first set of kobolds they encountered they had to come up with a solution on how to get out of the pit trap and and drag the 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 bodies I mean, they were they were still alive but drag everyone unconscious out um so uh kind of letting the dice fall where it may and just sort of looking at them like so what do you guys want to do like this this is this is where you know what you're you know uh faced with and um you know they took their lumps the first session um i thought that might have if they had all died i suspect that might have been the last session too but um but then the second session, they had this wonderful success and they defeated these bandits. So um, uh, as far as, you know, it's just, it, it's kid has an idea. I, I look to the rest of the group. What do you guys think about this? I mean, my son, God bless him. He actually went tried to convince the group to go back to the kobolds, befriend the kobolds so they could go back to the, sneak into the keep uh to rob the money lender once they realized what the money lender had so uh, the, the rest of the group shot that down but we entertained it we entertained it so okay and then yep yeah i go up to uh, frank the same question for you what techniques do you use to craft stories to captivate and inspire children's imaginations I, just a quick follow-up to Lord Mateus. I, I actually found his last anecdote ra rather amusing because if you flip the script and you made adults the players, uh, the, the one that said, let's go back and befriend the kobolds would probably be the one that would be the, the odd man out and 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 uh, would, would not see much success in that discussion space. Um, but in, in as far as... Uh, Answer the question. I mean, we, we talked about this a lot. Uh, you're leveraging stories that they know, whether it's comic books, movies, TV shows. Uh, give them quick, snappy, clear goals to achieve um, with an end result. And then you build obstacles back from that. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, in this case, you're also talking about not just what the player character capabilities are, but also what the interests and capabilities of the actual players are. Um, like we were mentioning, I think it was uh, Naga Hyde mentioned, uh, talk about what that person is interested in and lace that detail into the adventure. So kind of you, you suck back into the adventure design phase and try and put those Easter eggs in there so that at, at the very least it tweaks their interest. They've got something to, to, to tie into and, and draw in a bit of their immersion into the, the game space again. Um, again, like I, I have a, a, a post on my adventure design philosophy, uh, you know, just the, the goose egg method, um, for lack of a better way of putting it. And, it. and it's just basically you start from here. This is your end result. And uh, how, what are the two or three uh, for kids? No more than two or three nodes that they got to go through to get to the end state to 
steal or steal back something that was stolen or rescue somebody that was uh, that needs rescuing or to reveal something at the end because uh, you know sometimes uh, the the end result doesn't necessarily have to be that concrete kids are capable of taking uh, you know the curveballs that you can throw at them every once in a while where at the end of the adventure maybe it's just a computer printout or a newspaper or a clue that leads to the next adventure and, and that's resolution where they might have fought off the enemy forces or uh, discovered the secret lair that they weren't supposed to discover, quote unquote. And they found the, 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 the reveal for the next adventure, whatever that happens to be. Uh, but a lot of the things, uh, you know, Naga Hyde and, and Lord Mateus covered, I think were, were, uh, were really good points. So how do you adapt a, a traditional RPG scenarios or modules, um, adventures, whatever, to make them more suitable for children? I, we talked about a lot of the, the, the specific topics that you're either going to shave that ice cube into something that is more appropriate for their age group, or you're just going to kind of gloss over, uh, you know, the, the violence or, the, you know, the religion or the politics, those kinds of things. Uh, but in my case, one of the things that I do that I found is really good for kids and, and quite frankly, kind of a sneaky little uh, aside for other game masters that are looking for ideas. Um, you, you look at Wikipedia for the episode guides for pick any show that you could think of. Saturday morning cartoons for kids, cop dramas, uh, you know, maybe not quite as in depth as Law and Order. But chips. You look for <laughs> chip, chip, I uh, sure chips. I mean, if you want to go that far back. You know, the greatest American hero. Oh, there Dukes, you go. Dukes of Hazard. I mean, some of those were the zaniest TV shows you could watch. But that that buffoonery that the NPC villains would do, big white freaking car with the, the big white cowboy driven by the, you know, by the, the chauffeur and, and the crazy sheriff uh, causing tomfoolery. And then you got the main characters that are driving around and doing crazy jumps over river X, Y, or Z. Um, those provide a framework for adventure design that you can then just kind of take the major muscle movements and just plug it in there. And if it's something that the kids already show an interest, just plagiarism is, is one of the best forms of, uh, you know, uh, providing a compliment to somebody for doing a good job. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an old army trick. You know, that's an expression we use a lot. Uh, plagiarism is the best form of compliment you can give somebody. Yeah, best form, we, you say best form of flattery. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and off you get. So in my case, I went and uh, looked at the TV show for, uh, what was it? Totally Spies and uh, um, the Ladybug show which were both targeted to girls. And I just drew those adventures out and, and created the framework for what it is that, I, you know, we went, we went and did. This one's for all of you. Cause I don't know who may or may not do this. What's up? Real quick, Max. I just want to say one thing to you and Frank. Uh, thank you. You both gave me a great idea for my next road hogs chips. Versus Dukes to Hazard. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, what uh, what role do visual aids and props play in enhancing the immersion, the storytelling, the creativity around kids? And this is for everybody. For for me, real quick, I I don't do so much the visual aids because I do theater of the mind. I I wouldn't uh, deal too much with the visual aids, particularly because. Um, I, I think, especially kids, where you pull that visual aid inadvertently will will kind of guide them in a certain way that that they may not realize they 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 want to go or should go. Um, so I, I just don't I just don't do it. I I kind of agree with uh, Frank on that. Um, uh, I, I what I've been doing is. Uh, all theater of the mind for the most part. I mean, when I was doing the solo stuff with my son, I mean, that uh, the, the zero prep shadow dark generation rules kind of require you to like draw out maps because it's got dice drop techniques and whatnot. So we would draw out the hexes and, and draw out real quick sketch of like the dice drop for the town and the dice drop for this like swamp 
uh, uh, fortress that he discovered. Uh, but uh, but those are maps, right? They're not actual visual aids in the sense of like a picture or a, a, a weird prop or something. Okay. Um, the only reason why I want to do the thing with the map on the table is as sort of like a reward because they actually accomplished something uh, in the game world. Um, especially after the disaster of their first four way into foray into the caves of chaos. So that was really more for encouragement purposes and to kind of give them something to like manipulate, like, oh, hey, we, we discovered something here. We had to run away, but we're going to mark it on the map or so and so died here. We'll mark it on the map. I, you know, so they can kind of help tell their own story. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with Frank. Like if, if, um, that there's this impulse to be, you know, grab, I don't have anything in, in reach, but grab like a uh, monster man. You'd be like, and this is what you see, you know, and that you immediately sort of like constrain that imagination. Um, and I think it's actually more fun for me when I describe um, the creature that they're fi fighting or, or encountering. And, um, and I can kind of set the tone a little bit, have more control over the tone of the encounter anyway. And, I, and that's how I even feel when playing with adults. So. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, I'm gonna disagree. Least... Oh, go ahead. I, I just, I disagree. I, uh, I use handouts. <laughs> There's, uh, I do do theater of the mind when it's palladium system, but if I'm running Dungeons and Dragons, I love to throw the handouts. Like I have like notes that they can read. Uh, I have medallions that they can hold on to or and wear. Like I have a Takesis necklace that I that I uh, put together so that. If we now know who he serves, I get it. <laughs> oh, it's just and a even, laying around. Right, yeah. And I have I have coins that they can hold in their hands when they receive, you know, money from selling something or they find a treasure or whatever. I, I think it helps helps them have something tangible that they can hold on to to invigorate that imagination so that goes Especially, back to engaging all five senses because I, yeah, I i agree right. with the concept of the imagination because i i uh, you start talking to me about battle maps and minis and that's actually going to be a segment or an episode in the future that's gonna be a tough one for me not to just blatantly blurt out uh, um, my animosity towards <laughs> battle maps and and uh and and miniatures at, at that time but there is something especially for kids, but it's like opening up a present. You know, you get this little scroll and oh, you open it up. I've actually seen that at tables that I wasn't playing at. Uh, I, I get both sides on that one. I actually uh, kind of agree with Noghide in terms of the tactile response. I, I don't necessarily uh, use it myself, but I can certainly see where that would be a rewarding experience or certainly be able to increase the immersion and, and draw the, for lack of a better term, the, you know, their, their, their fertile imaginations into what it is that you're trying to portray. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just don't necessarily go too far down that road. Yeah, actually, not, I, I don't care so if I ask Naga had a question. Um, did you, when you've done, when you've handed these things, I mean, was there like a positive reaction to the kids you were playing with? Oh, yeah. They're I, like, they always, seem like super excited like oh my god like oh i'm actually getting something like because when like when i'd play riffs or tmnt i didn't have anything to hand out because i was playing so sandbox that i didn't have time to create something right because i was sure i'm playing off the cuff they they were engaged they were having a good time but when I play Dungeons and Dragons and I have time to, because I'm playing based off of a book and I can create printouts of things to hand them, like all of a sudden there's a change in how excited they are about the game. Because now they it, it's something they can take with them. They can put in my son and some of his friends still have things that are like pinned on their walls uh, of of treasures or notes that they received in past dungeons and dragons adventures so 
it's something that they keep as a memory of that game. Well, that's cool, man. And that gives me a little more confidence with my idea of the map table that they're going to get from the Castellan. So, all right, cool. I learned something today. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Successful stream. The lowest <laughs> viewer count I've had on a Friday stream in ages and we have a success so who cares <laughs> they, those folks are gonna have to wait more than a month to see the success all right um let's hit this chat here rex teal said something a lot of the advice for designing adventures for kids should honestly be transferred to adult groups i thought that was funny but it's also true it's funny because it's true all right uh now I'm going to change up the order here just a little bit because he's already touched on the topic and I want him to keep going on it now. So we're going up to Frank here. So how do you handle the introduction of plot twists or unexpected events in a way that keeps children excited rather than frustrated? Organically, uh, whenever possible, in terms of laying out the clues that lead from one to another. Um, and, and by that, I mean, like, typically every one of those goose eggs that I talk about in terms of adventure design will probably uh, have a specific thing that leads to the next section or provides them a clue that at the end of the adventure gives them something to work with in the next adventure that might be planned. Um, and, and in some cases, I, I might use an NPC to kind of force the issue if it's not coming across the way that I need it to or would like it to. Um, you're also trying to tie into the PC background or something that ties into the players. Like we, we talked about this before. Um, and in some cases, it might just be one of those, those uh, you know, those, you know, like the old 80s films and the old 80s TV shows you drop it at the last section right before the TV goes to a commercial break, the the da -da -da moment, and then you move on from there. Um, some examples might be like, uh, you know, where uh, I introduced the companion uh, was in an adventure that she, she had to go and rescue somebody. It turned out to be the NPC. Now the NPC is on for the ride. Um, you know, you, you try and uh, reveal, uh, you know, there's a snatch and grab, at the end, there's the revelation that there's another secret spy organization out there. Uh, and then uh, you, you, you kind of layer that into there. This is the same kind of concept you could use for an adult adventure scenario. You just have to be more cognizant that you might have to do a bit more spoon feeding in terms of what it is that you're trying to lay down in front of them. What, <clears throat> excuse me, what techniques do you use to turn a potentially frustrating situation into an exciting challenge? I, I, thankfully, I've never had to encounter that uh, yet. <laughs> so um, it's it's not so much some that I haven't thought of. I, I just haven't encountered it yet. So I, I can't really speak to with any kind of authority on that. Okay. Not a problem. Maybe I'll pop uh, that to one of the other guys or they can speak up on it, but uh, I'm going to move on down to Naga Hyde. Uh, how do you handle the introduction of plot twists or unexpected events in a way that keeps children excited rather than frustrated? Uh, well, you really have to know the children that you're going to use the plot twists or uh, unexpected events in your game. Like, because some children, they might not handle it well if either of those things hurt their character uh, that they're playing. Uh, it really depends on the maturity level of the player. Uh, even adults have issues with plot twists or <laughs> unexpected events sometimes. I ran into that myself recently. I love it, I love it when they act like it's, oh, I saw that coming. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I use them sparingly and only if it's absolutely crucial to a good story. Uh, with children, I tend to keep it very simple and straightforward uh, until they're older. Like maybe I'll start out with like a thief breaks in and steals something from one of the characters, you know, or the bad guy gets away because they were betrayed by another NPC, right? Uh, if the players can handle that, then I'll move up to like big stuff, like a real betrayal 
or a loss such as a character's family member being kidnapped or killed or something you know as they get older not when they're young but as they're old grow older okay uh, and for uh, uh, Alter, a TTRPG, I will try to ask that question if there's time at the end. Uh, you and one other one, there may there may be time for that uh, when we get to the end. But uh, that is a good question. Uh, so, because you seem to be the one that leans towards this at least openly more. I'm not saying the other guys don't do it at all. But uh, what role does humor play in your games, and how do you incorporate it effectively? Uh. Now we're talking. We're talking let, humor I, for kids now. <laughs> right, 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 right. No, I got, I got it. I got it. I, I let it happen naturally. Um, it if most of the time I found that the kids themselves will create the humor within the game. Like they'll do something super silly, and everybody at the table will laugh. Uh, I don't try and force in humor in any game, whether it's adults or kids. You have to let that happen naturally. So, so, so for the show, because we talked about this a little bit before, and maybe not directly with the term, you know, humor. But how would you milk that to keep them, you know, smiling and engaged and going forward while still moving the game forward as well? <sighs> How would I keep it? Going? I mean, like, like for for adults, we happen to, we meme a lot of stuff, right? Like something will happen, and then we'll keep bringing it up. We'll keep bringing it up. We'll keep bringing it up. And you know, for adults, that's that's a way to uh, to nudge somebody or be like, ah, that was funny. Remember this happened? You know, in, in a very quick, nuanced way. For children, things are a little more. <laughs> I was gonna say bludgeon with a hammer. No, that's not what I mean. A little more, uh, a little more blatant, a little bit more, you know, on the nose. So if you, if they find something funny, if they find something interesting, how would you keep them engaged with that? But that's that's a really tough question because it it really depends on the situation. Some things that they might find humorous, you don't want to keep bringing it up. Because it might Fair. have, because, well, because something that's humorous in that moment can become embarrassing for the player later if it keeps getting brought up. So you have okay. to be really careful with that because if you, if something becomes embarrassing, that child may not want to play the game anymore. And you, the whole point is to keep them playing, not discourage them. Right. Okay. All right, then, uh, yes, I'm on to Lord Mattias. That's good, because I skipped you this time, because I'm a horrible, horrible person. You get to go last again, or save the best for last. Uh, how do you handle the introduction of plot twists or unexpected events in a way that keeps children excited rather than frustrated? Uh, uh, this is my answer to this one is um, just like the last one. I, I don't do a lot of story. I've been running a sandbox, so the plot twist stuff, um and the unexpected stuff if it if it happens it's actually coming from uh it's actually coming from the players uh, the kids and what what they're doing and something wacky happens so um and so in in my position it's just tapping into that game master um you know skill set of rolling with the unexpected and just doing what you can to keep things moving along um you know when um the they learn the hard way for example when they first encountered the kobolds you got to search for traps you know so they fell into two two people to the first frontliners fell into the pit and then the kobolds came out and ambushed him and people started dropping and uh that's when they also learned the you know the value of teamwork and they survived um so uh you know at that point um you know, the ideas just started coming out of them and how to handle this unexpected event. Um, and I got to yeah, handle some interesting questions like, oh, if I cast <laughs> this holy weapon, uh, it makes my axe glow, right? I'm like, yeah, so we're stuck in this pit that would, that would kind of light things up so we can kind of see the mechanism to the pit trap. And I'm like, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah, you can. And that and so the two of them, the cleric and the fighter, uh, were able to basically find a way to get out of the pit trap and then get everyone else out. So um, you know, things like that. I just just feed off of what they're doing and um and just be prepared for the unexpected because they're they're the ones that are gonna do it. Like I don't know if I'd be like obviously with adults, if you're writing something like an actual a more linear story arc kind of thing, the those kind of plot twists we look for and we enjoy. Um, but I I think it was Nagahide said this, you know, there might be some hurt feelings there if it was so so unexpected. And I think Frank may have said something about the spoon thing. One of you two did. I think that if you're gonna be doing that, you're gonna have to spoon feed, especially if you're dealing with eight to twelve year olds. Um and, and at that point, I wonder if it's even worth it. Um, so just let them know who the bad guy is, just like you do in the cartoons. Like, you know who Shredder is, right? You know mm -hmm. Megatron's the bad guy. So just let them no. know who the bad guy is. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I, yeah, so I guess, yeah, I don't have a great answer. I Because I say okay. I've been running a sandbox, so. I got gotcha. you. Uh, all right. Well, then I'm not going to ask you a follow-up because all my follow-ups are not sandbox appropriate. <laughs> uh, anything that you guys wanted to uh, to address? I think what I'll do is, you know what I'll do? I'm going to ask the two uh, the two questions that have been posted by uh, people in chat, one on YouTube, one on Rumble, oh. and we'll knock those out pretty quick. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to... Uh, uh, I made a good point about comedy. Uh, I just wanted to add you know, the kids will do goofy stuff and they'll start laughing and, and, and it's a joke to them. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea if you should try to play into that humor too much because kids actually kind of have their own language mm -hmm. um, and you might actually kind of ruin the moment for them. So um, I know when they have been laughing and goofing, you know, me and my the, my two friends that are there, the uh, the only, the two dads that are playing, you know, we're just kind of looking at each other. That's fair. and then when the laughing starts, I'm like, okay, let's go, <laughs> you know, let's move on. So that that would be my only concern is if you're trying to like uh, use a language, you know, that little child, little child. Language well, it might be funny not... for them too. If, hey, when your dad tried to say, <laughs> yeah, you're right, yeah, like try to riz Ohio, no cap, <laughs> you know, all that stuff, yeah. I don't know what you just said, but okay. Um, Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Crafty had a question earlier where he asked, uh, how would you run a game for elementary school kids versus high school kids? Now, we don't have to dive into this too deeply, but th there's probably going to be a difference there. So uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Lord Mattias in this one, just, uh, just going around the horn here. Um. Uh, well, you know, the first one I did was for elementary school kids. So I made it really simple. I don't, that one was a little bit more plot oriented, more linear. Um, I don't remember much about it, but it, I tapped into basic, you know, fantasy tropes. Um, there was a hag and she was the bad guy. Um, and when, and it was mostly girls playing. Uh, so when they wanted to start befriending the, the, the wargs that they found, you know, I played along with that. Now, <laughs> high school kids, uh, yeah, they wanted to have pets. Uh, the high school kids, um, I haven't really run anything for high school kids, but um, I know Frank mentioned this earlier. They're going to be able to handle more complexity in terms of story, um, problems, obstacles, themes. Um, and uh, I think I would... Um, be more comfortable leaning into that, you know? Um, and again, one of these two guys had mentioned something about um, as they get a little older, you add that layer of complexity. And I think that's exactly what you want to do. So. Okay. Uh, Frank, did you want to jump in on that one? Just how the difference between running for elementary versus high school? Yeah. High school, I think is probably the closest analog to running for an adult as you're going to get uh, fairly common themes and, and, and how deep you can get into it uh, for, for grade school kids. Um, they are, uh, I mentioned this earlier. I mean, like not in a negative sense, but they're, they're kind of like uh, anarchy embodied um, in terms of some of the ways that they would approach an adventure scenario that you might find is well structured for an adult 
is completely inappropriate for a kid. So you've got to be <laughs> wide open for them to take you uh, down a different garden path to get to the solution space that you thought they should get to. Uh, that being said, you, you got to be, you got to tame a lot of the, the topics, the tropes and, and the action for that group. And, and in case like the, the, the younger you go, the more I would go into, uh, let's start talking about, uh, you know, the framework, the mechanics, let's deal more with group interaction, teamwork uh, capabilities, and then how each individual character's um, capabilities dovetail with the rest to find that solution space for whatever that, 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 that adventure piece that they're trying to get over. Be it a be it a puzzle, be it a physical obstacle, be it an actual conflict, um, and and tailor it to what they are capable to take. Okay, and now Hyde, any final words on that? Uh, I think Lord Mateus and Frank uh, hit it pretty good. The one thing I would like to add, Frank uh, mentioned that uh, a teenage game is as close as you're going to get to an adult game. That's absolutely true um but you still have to be very wary be very aware of what adult themes you're going to bring into that game because they're still kids so you you can't there's certain adult themes you you, you still don't want to bring in there. I can tell Even you, we would have made our, if you were an adult, and uh, this is when I was in junior high, senior high, well, ninth grade was junior high for us still. Um, I promise you this, we probably would have had the adults stop us because the themes that we were bringing up would have made the adults cringe. Not And especially in right. modern society, modern where you can't say word boo to anybody without being some sort of ophile. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it, I laugh because I was the kid, you know, on the other side of that. My warning is you got as an adult, you've got to nip that stuff in the bud. Oh, these are more mature kids. No, you were right, Noghide. They are still kids. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was the same way as a teenager. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Frank. I was just going to say their solution space probably leans more towards the hack and slash solution. So, like, uh, you know, it's just give them a dungeon crawl and tell them to go find loot um, and, and, and watch the dice. But fly. if there are any girls there, I want to do them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, again, you got to tailor to the player as much as you do the player character. And, and and I say that not not to you know get weird or creepy on here, but like I said, I was I was the teenager, and I know the group that I was in, and we had three girls and three guys who were like the core players of our groups, and that was an interesting dynamic. Um, no adult would have been able, or would have been willing. We would have had to have been scolded like actual elementary school kids. <laughs> yeah, my great my gaming group was the same way, Max, when I was a teenager in high school. But the, as an adult playing, running a game for teenagers, nah, I cut that <laughs> stuff right out. <laughs> All right, then we had one other question uh, on the Rumble side. Uh, question, what sort of game would you have the kids play first in order to learn? Rules light or more crunch? And I know there's an argument for both sides. And uh, I don't care. Well, Frank, go ahead and start. I, in in all honesty, you're going to tailor the game anyways. And in my example, it was Rifts slash Heroes Unlimited merged together. Um, so I, I don't know necessarily. I, I'm not conversant with the uh, games that are targeted from the get-go towards kids. Uh, from my perspective, it's uh, something that you can any game can be tailored to the audience. You just got to be sure of... Uh, who it is that you're getting to sit at the table and understand their limitations before you start rolling dice and you start throwing big bad monsters against them or start asking them to do things that they're not quite comfortable to do. Uh, and again, that, that goes back to what we discussed earlier, uh, understanding your audience, maybe doing a session zero and then having them try out their characters first. Um, and, 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 and that's regardless that that's, that's not game specific. Um, but I know there are games out there designed for kids. I just have absolutely no idea what they would look like. 
Okay. I, I, I agree with Frank on that one. Uh, although I, my, my first time running a game for kids was a bit of both. The crunch was the character creation, but then I went Lucy with, with the combat rules and the, and the skill rules and stuff. So I do kind of a combination. Um, well, uh, as I said earlier, you know, I purposely chose Shadow Dark because I thought it would be, it would appeal to the 5e, the 12 year olds who've been playing 5e, mm. and it was also, it will be easy to pick up, um, but also incredibly flexible because it's more of an OSR in, in style and tone of gameplay. Um, so and and i feel like that's been successful um i know again my son may have been a little too young when i showed him the rule cyclopedia but when he was four it was like super simple like i said i just had smiley faces that eventually went to x's in his eyes for when his character died and i just simply asked him do you want to play a strong character a fast character or a smart character he said strong so he got a plus three on strength checks then I was like, what is he next? Fast or smart? And he said he's fast. So then he got a plus one on decks and a plus zero on intelligence. And that's all we played and how we played. Um, I I don't know if I, like if, if I had a group of high schoolers that came to me hypothetically and said, hey, we want you to teach us how to role play. I don't know if I'd whip out Adventure Conqueror King system because <laughs> uh, that that's pretty crunchy, right? Um, but maybe if they, if i felt like they you know if i had knew a little bit more about them so i i but but again like my personal taste is i like that the the on the more rules light side of things so i i personally whether i'm playing with adults or kids i have a little bit more flexibility i like that ruling over rules um aspect of the game so that's just my personal Crafty it. made a, a statement here that I want to comment on. He says, I think young teenagers uh, enjoy crunchy games because young teenagers look to break systems more. Interesting that that he said that because the games that I played when you know getting into the hobby, of course, I played D&D first, but I don't even like to count that at some point because uh, <laughs> it was immediately taken from me with the satanic panic. Uh, but I mean, then I moved to Battletech, which I don't consider a role-playing game, obviously. That's a tabletop war game. But one of the reasons why I liked it so much was compared to every other tabletop war game that my friends were playing, it had rules that I could understand and made sense. I could memorize them quickly. Uh, it, it, they weren't complex and they weren't depth, but they were meaningful. And then I saw, and then the first role playing game that I really got into was Robotech, <laughs> TMNT. So Palladium system, even in the TMNT book, which is much smaller than say the Rifts book, those rules are, I don't know, I, I don't call them crunchy; they're clumsy. Uh, that, that's the easiest way to say it. I think more to the point, it's it, if you're going to GM uh, any system, make sure that you're well versed with the rules so that you understand which ones to break, which ones to bend, which ones to completely ignore. Uh, Palladium rules are not necessarily the easiest ones to explain to a modern audience because they're more probably exposed to the D20 system, the, the, you know, whether it's 5e, Pathfinder, or whatever the case may be, it's probably 5e. Um, and then bringing them over to something like that as long as you're able to make an engaging story, uh, run with it. Uh, but you have to understand what you're going to play with in terms of the framework, wh what you bend, what you break, what you ignore. So, so we would argue yeah, I, constantly over Palladium rules ba back then. Like we, like that. This is why when I see some of the arguments, I'm like, "Yep, remember having that one back in 1980? <laughs> Whatever, it's still going on." Uh, but, but the difference is this, and. I think back then we struggled to get it right because we learned a couple of things from D and D and other games. Read the FN manual. Read it nowadays, and I'm not saying this about you guys and running with kids at all. I would not require a six year old to read the rule cyclopedia. Okay, but as teenagers, yes, I actually would. Uh, like it's like I'm not going to fudge it for you because you should know how the game works. And then that goes into Crafty's second comment, which was uh, the goal for a young teenager making that perfect character that does the most damage. Uh, young teens are the min maxers, right? Yeah, we we all went through that phase. Some stayed 
in that phase. Uh, I, so I, I get what he's saying, but I think there's a different dynamic there for children. At least what I'm visualizing as children, I don't care. You know, all you guys said the right stuff. Either start with the rules light game or fudge the rules anyway. Don't don't bog them down in the rules. You're going to take their fun away from that. Throw it at them, you know, as necessary. But for teenagers, screw that. You all are supposed to be littered at this point. <laughs> Like, like, like we did it. Now, did did we play correctly? No. I, I, I name one person that played D and D right the first time you played D and D. Name one person who ever played Palladium right, well, ever. But I mean, the first time you played Palladium, uh, like, like it's okay to make mistakes, but you should understand that framework if you're a teenager or an adult. I, I will admit, I didn't. So when I when I started role playing i started in the palladium system our game master was a was my best friend so he had a rule and i followed the rule until we graduated and i left for the army his rule was he was the only one that had the books i was like okay fine not a problem i won't you're gonna manage the game then you're gonna make sure we all understand what's going on I didn't realize until I bought the books myself that we never played the game correctly, <laughs> especially in the terms of the combat rules. Cause I, I went through them and I was like, this is not at all. Did he change it? Be did he change it or was he just ignorant to the rules? I don't know. I never oh, okay. found out. He, so, but my guess is he probably changed it to his understanding of what the rules should be. Which but that's, that's, but fine, that's the it thing. Worked. Yeah, and, and that, that's kind of the point, especially when you're playing with, with kids. And I'm talking the younger yep. ones. I think we said 14 and younger before. Um, it's okay. That's absolutely okay. At some point, though, as they're growing into the hobby more and more, if they like the hobby, okay, it's, it's time to really focus on what we're supposed to be doing, dare I say, the more correct way. But if you decide, you know what, we've been doing this for you know five years, and this is the way we want to keep playing it, then, then make the game yours and, and just keep playing it that way. And people might say that the Palladium system is crunchy, but the reason I like to start people in the Palladium system is because in my opinion there are way more character options that can be created based on the idea of what a child wants to play mm -hmm. i get that all right um did you have something you wanted to jump in there okay uh did that did that because we got to move on to the sorry did that one we need to move on to the next segment here do, do, do. let's read some of the chat unless you guys have any final comments you want to bring up i'm gonna get, i'm gonna read some chat and move on to the next segment all right uh failure roles can be great for comedy yeah you a couple of you guys have mentioned that uh either through failure or some bad dice rolls that that it made a kid sad and believe me uh i can understand that but i think that's one of the things that as an adult we can shape that failure into something that is funny and not detrimental i don't mean mockery i mean something that that okay you know what you failed but you know that was a funny fail you're fine let's let's move on. i think there's a way to do that he says probably the best way to run a game for kids is teach kids uh, that are interested to run games for, for one another. Kids tend to get the most enjoyable social experiences with like age people. As the outsider without kids, I'd say I agree with that. But <laughs> I, yeah, I, I can buy really into that. That's that's one of those things where you know, as 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 an older GM, you're you're mentoring the next generation, so to speak, to take the mantle and and then run their group the way that they see fit. Um, are are there are are a bunch of twelve to fourteen year olds going to want to sit down with the dad of somebody at the table? Maybe, maybe not. Um, Once or twice, but after that, they're going to want to do it on their own, right? Yeah, exactly. So you know, you set them up for success, uh, which kind of leads into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the next segment, mm -hmm. and, and and then you just watch them flourish, and then vicariously you can enjoy the, you know, you just watch them enjoy the experience and you go, yeah, that was, that was partly me, but I'm, I'm watching them and I'm loving what I'm seeing. 
Uh, Frank, that's exactly the motivation behind my Dungeons and Dads Keep on the Borderlands campaign that kind of introduced these kids to this awesome thing and then kind of like passing the baton. So now we're going to look at some kids that need parent that have yeah, parenting issues. I watch kids run games where they summon greater ele elementals. Oh my god, I cannot read. Uh, air elementals that were F5 tornadoes that were purposely unleashed on an innocent town while they all laughed. Those kids need better parents. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But that's that's the whole point of, of children having a different view of stuff. You know, it's all the problem, right? I don't know what problem they were trying to solve with an <laughs> F5 tornado, but uh, well, that's that's one way of doing it, I guess. They were playing uh, Village of Hamlet in the Temple of Elemental Evil. They sided with the temple. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Rex Hill says, Crunch in and of itself isn't bad at all. What's bad is when it restricts creati uh, creativity outside the box actions like, pa or creative outside the box actions like Pathfinder. 100 percent agree when players are playing character sheets and not characters that's when the crunch gets in the way if you're still playing your character I, I i said it earlier in the stream i've said it i said it on almost every stream i'll say it again i really get annoyed when somebody says i can't do that why not well it's not on here or i only have i i use the the, the pathfinder example if i only have a plus two everything else i have is plus nine plus two is better than a normal person yeah i can't do it <laughs> like play the character not the character sheet don't look at the character sheet for what you can do use your noggin and then the game master is the one that's supposed to say do you have that skill or that's a great idea let's let's have this modifier or whatever the game master needs to say being limited by a character sheet it drives me crazy i and that goes for adults as well I and mean, it's a bit of a tangent but i i, I had a game experience playing L5R, which which is not a game to introduce to kids whatsoever. It's just the, the, the you social don't like the clan, the, the clan mechanics. It's just way too complex, let alone the you know the D10 exploding dice uh, scenarios. Lion so, clan forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm Phoenix. No, clan clan all the way. Um, oh geez. Yeah, we, we rule we rule the empire, whether you like it or not. Um, mm. No, I had I had a guy playing a, a, a Phoenix Clan Shugenja who, for the life of me, decided to take skills like singing and dancing, and he racked and stacked those things to the maximum. And I was like, okay, that that's great. And then we got to a village that was occupied by a ghost, and the solution was they were supposed to take care of the ghost. This guy was like, nobody knows about magic except for me, right? Yeah. I'm going to do a dance and I'm going to sing and I'm going to try and get this, this ghost out of the way. And I was like, Oh, okay. There's typically, there's no way that this would work. And wouldn't you know it, this guy rolled so many dice. Um, you know, if you know the, the L5 R system mm -hmm. is his, his dance roll was 115. What? <laughs> wow. He had so many explode, like he'd roll, he was rolling, I think, four keep three dice. So he's rolling four D10s, keeping three. All four of them were zeros. I was like, statistically, this is an anomaly, but okay, there you go. So you got your 30, keep going. Two of them were tens, two of them were tens, another 10, and the ten, and they just kept on going until he got over 100. And at that point, I was like, you know what? You did something so significant that even the ghost decided to take off. Um, so <laughs> that's awesome. from that perspective, it's the same kind of idea where you just, the, the dice gods decided that this is probably something that should happen. Just go with it. Um, I could be wrong. It might not be Japanese, but I thought there was a Japanese myth based on the spectral dancer where you were dancing, where the ghost tries to entrap you. Uh, it, it, might and, be, it, it wasn't folded in this is. particular ghost, but yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't. I'm not sure if it's Japanese or not. I thought it was, but uh, anyway, I know Earthon picked it up. But uh, drink. All right. Oh, uh, where, where are we here? But that. But you're you're right. Uh, uh, game masters have to be more masters of the game. And I think somebody. Yeah, right here. Boom. Law Dog says next one I was going to read too. 
people forget that a game master is actually supposed to be a master of the game and that means a couple of things it means you're the master of of the table in terms of how the game is going to be played it does mean you are to be the master of the rules that means you have to understand them now that doesn't mean you can't change them doesn't mean that you are right one million percent of the time you can make a mistake you thought something's supposed to be plus three or plus four you know instead of a plus four but if you decide that it's plus three anyway that's your it's your job as the game master as long as you're fair reasonable and consistent and it also means that you can do exactly what he said you can master the game itself outside of just the crunch look at what happens with the dice rolls because these are still games so people who want to take the dice out of this are wrong these are still games these aren't role-playing sessions these are role-playing games so those dice come in and they can trip you up or they can give you weird things where you can dance a ghost away <laughs> And then, and thank you for the five dollars. Uh, five dollars again from Law Dog. He says uh, people say Palladium is crunchy, and maybe it is, but I think of it as hardy. The system's tough enough to handle just about any eventuality. Right, as long as you don't have, and this is coming from experience, as long as you don't have players that want to quibble over every little thing, because sometimes it can take an hour and a half to find the rule that you're looking for in some obscure book or whatever. Just roll with it, people always complain i think the next video i want to do that's gonna be how to for palladium is going to be on vehicle combat because people complain up and down the vehicle combat doesn't make sense you can't figure it out all you're doing is making a control roll and if you're trying to shoot out the window i think it's a minus two to fire how is that difficult and the percentage on the control roll doesn't tell you if i remember correctly it tells you if you're going this speed it's a, it's at no penalty if it's this speed it's at minus like 10 percent or whatever well guess what if you're going faster than that i'm gonna make it minus 20 well the book doesn't say it don't care i said it <laughs> you know you know you're going faster than even that you know you can do that as the game master you can't dash in dragon bane well yes you can in my game of dragon bane you can dash uh but uh, you better roll anything. <laughs> if you roll anything other than uh, a one on that roll, you smack into the wall. Take a D6 damage. You know, I'm not saying that's exactly what I do, but you get the point. You're the game master. Be the game master. Yeah, if, if there's a rule that I don't remember for Palladium, if I can't find it within five minutes, then I say, okay, I'll find it next week, but this is my ruling right now and move on with the game. And Rex Teal, you're right. I'm going to move on here. Let's start reading every chat out there. But but you're right. It means you, you at least have to know where it is. You have to have mastery over the book, over the game, over the concepts. Yep. Not necessarily every little dotted I and cross T. All right. Let's uh, let's get ready to move on into our fourth segment. Remember, we're supposed to be talking about gaming for kids. <laughs> uh, so just a reminder some rando rpg live stream airs live on fridays at 6 p.m central time except for the last friday of the month because that's our members only live stream once this live stream ends the full live stream will remain available to youtube members only while the four discussion segments will we will post later uh to the public a month later from now a month from now so if you enjoy this discussion please like this video and subscribe to all of the panelists channels which you can find in the description. 